Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is March 29, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 32. Over a century ago, in 1873, an inventor in New York began exhibiting a strange new device which he said would convey the human voice through wires over long distances. Calling his invention a telephone, he tried to attract financial support. But it was reported in the press that well-informed people knew it was impossible to transmit the human voice by wire, that wires could transmit only dots and dashes, such as the Morse code. Furthermore, it was said that even if the so-called telephone could do this, it would be of no practical value. And so, having been condemned as a fraud by self-styled authorities, the inventor was bundled off to jail. The inventor was discredited, and for three more years the public was denied the opportunity to judge for itself about the merits of the telephone. And as an old Lebanese proverb says, the error of a scholar is like the wreck of a ship. It sinks and scuttles others with it. But far from being impossible as claimed by the self-styled scholars of that day, the telephone was inevitable, an idea whose time had come. In 1876 another inventor, Alexander Graham Bell, unveiled a working model of the telephone. Today Bell's name is a household word and all the false prophets who had said, It can't be done, are forgotten forever. Today there are many self-proclaimed authorities who condemn as nonsense anything they don't understand. It happened with the telephone, the automobile, the airplane, space travel, and so on. Today it is happening in regard to underwater missiles, particle beam weapons, floating Soviet cosmospheres, and other life and death matters. Today our secret rulers are trying to cover up so many things in so many ways that it's becoming increasingly difficult to do so. As always, their own secret political and economic plans and maneuvers are kept under wraps until they are ready to spring on the unsuspecting public only now their plans no longer work smoothly as they once did. But beyond that, elaborate efforts are being mounted to hide from the public the disastrous military and space setbacks suffered by the United States in recent months. Soviet sabotage operations, about which I have been giving a warning for nearly a year, are now taking an increasing toll and Government spokesmen are working overtime to make exploding grain elevators, exploding factories, exploding refineries, exploding railroad tank cars, and explosions in power plants all seem unrelated. And to keep the lid on events related to Russia's total military domination of space, not only Government personnel but also selected Congressional, academic, industrial and scientific spokesmen are being pressed into service. They think that by siding with the Soviet Union, the winning side, they will end up being treated very well. But traitors are traitors and can never be trusted, so collaborators are always the first to be eliminated after a country is conquered. As for our secret rulers themselves, together with their intimates, the precedent they themselves established in the Nuremberg Trials after World War II will be applied. In the aftermath of the coming nuclear war, the traitors who have destroyed America from within will be tried for war crimes and duly executed. Today my three special topics are Topic No. 1, Cosmospheres, Cosmos Strategy and the Ignored Warnings of General Thomas Power. Topic No. 2, Soviet Preparations to Invade the United States. And Topic No. 3, 
how events are converging toward nuclear holocaust. Topic No. 1 On a sleepy late spring day in June 1957, members of an engineering society gathered in Los Angeles to hear about the efforts of the United States Air Force in space technology. The speaker, General Thomas Power, P.O.W.E.R. The following month General Power would become Commander-in-Chief of the Strategic Air Command, SAC. But on that day in June 1957 he was completing three years as head of the Air Force's Research and Development Command. As such, General Power was then America's leading authority on the overall military potentials of space, so his audience expected to hear about these potentials from General Power. But in General Power's own words, published eight years later, he said, quote, I had to disappoint them. Guided by official policy, I carefully avoided any reference to satellites, space vehicles, and man in space. Instead, I talked about the Air Force's high-altitude studies, the impact of solar phenomena on communications, and related subjects." Unquote. Less than four months later, on October 4, 1957, mankind was thrust into the space age by the beep-beep-beep of Sputnik 1 launched by the Soviet Union. And thanks to the disgraceful official policies that muzzled General Power and others, the American people were caught totally off guard. Fifteen months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 19 I told you the rest of the story about the so-called Sputnik 1 surprise a disgrace which need never have happened. To General Power the Sputnik shock itself was bad enough, but he drew from that experience even more important lessons for the future. To him, given the other military and technical facts in his possession, Sputnik 1 was only an omen of far more serious things to come and he fervently believed that only an informed, aroused American public could prevent eventual disaster for America, so he decided to put his warnings into print. In April 1959, as the Eisenhower era was on the wane, General Power, Commander of the Strategic Air Command, followed required procedures and submitted his book to the Defense Department for approval prior to publication. The book contained no military secrets yet it was banned instantly by the Secretary of Defense. Unknown to General Power, America's secret rulers had already decided upon a complete revolution in America's military strategy to begin in 1961 with the new administration. It was to be a two-pronged strategy, half visible and half invisible. The visible part would involve the gradual weakening and disarmament of the United States, which our rulers would always sell to us as initiatives for peace, quote unquote, but which would actually lead to war. The hidden part of the new strategy, however, would involve the continued secret development of new superweapons with which the Soviet Union could be utterly destroyed in the war to come. And the centerpiece of this two-pronged strategy for world domination was to be America's Moon Program, sold to the public as a peaceful venture, but actually intended for military purposes. It is this two-pronged secret military scheme of our secret rulers that unraveled just six months ago on September 27, 1977. It is this scheme that led to America's disastrous defeat in the secret space battle of the Harvest Moon which knocked out America's secret moon base in Copernicus Crater, and it is this scheme that would have been threatened by publication of General Power's book in 1959. In 1965, after General Power retired, he finally succeeded in having his book, Designed for Survival, published in extensively revised form. The publisher was Coward McCann of New York, but the original banned version was never published. After nearly 20 years, 
I believe the time is long overdue for the American public to hear some of the things about which the late General Thomas Power tried in vain to give a warning. After considerable effort and expense, I have at last been able to obtain a copy of the original Band manuscript by General Power which will be under lock and key by the time you hear this recording. As I read his words to you, keep in mind, please, that they were written two decades ago. Only in that way can you realize just how much is being kept from you by the Federal Government. On page 60 of the Band manuscript, General Power says that, quote, Deterrence is the sum total of many diverse elements which in combination serve to convince our enemies that if they choose to precipitate a nuclear war, the United States will survive and they will not." Unquote. Three years after General Power wrote these words, he was proven right in the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, but his book remained banned, so this lesson was not driven home in American minds and true deterrence was gradually allowed to disappear. On page 67 of the Band Manuscript he speaks of a Soviet decision to start a war against the United States. Quote, First, there must be adequate assurance that the war will result in a decisive victory for them and unconditional surrender on our part. Unquote. A few lines later he said, quote, the second condition that must be satisfied before the Soviet rulers would undertake aggression against the United States is the assurance that they can prevent our retaliatory counterattack from inflicting unacceptable damage upon them." Unquote. My friends, in light of these criteria, judge for yourself about the significance of the runaway Soviet military superiority over the United States. For example, Consider just one small part of the picture, the incredibly massive Soviet Civil Defense Program versus non-existent Civil Defense in the United States. Does it matter that according to government figures the Soviet Union might lose 5 million people while the United States could lose 160 million in a nuclear exchange? Or are government spokesmen right? when they assure you this imbalance means nothing. On page 68 of the Band Manuscript, General Power says that, quote, An added problem is the reaction of the Russian people. There can be no doubt that in a nuclear war they would accept heavy losses without protest so long as they believed that the United States, not Russia, was responsible for the war. Unquote. In light of this, my friends, where is Jimmy Carter's so-called tough talk against the Soviet Union lately really leading? Does he himself even know what he is saying? Already his words and those of Secretary of Defense Harold Brown have become the basis of an intense propaganda campaign inside Russia about the increasingly threatening posture of the United States. And some diplomats are already saying that Soviet-American relations are now the worst they have been since the Cuban crisis over 15 years ago. On page 141 of the Band Manuscript, General Power says that since the Soviet Union must destroy both our military muscle and our power to rebuild that muscle, quote, the objective of a Soviet attack would be a thorough destruction of the country." Unquote. And on page 142 he gives a Soviet military authority's words, quote, Atomic and hydrogen weapons alone, without the decisive operations of the ground forces with their contemporary materiel, cannot decide the outcome of war." Unquote. In other words, after the initial nuclear attack an invasion of the United States will follow. Describing the true status of the extensive Soviet technological and industrial effort two decades ago, he said we were already in a neck-and-neck -neck race. And on page 212 he warned of, quote, 
the danger that the Soviets may pull ahead of us in the technological race if they can maintain their present pace and we fail to accelerate ours. They are matching our military effort, although their economy is only about 40 per cent of ours. Because of their ruthless methods and low living standards, they can buy more progress in military technology than we can buy for an equivalent amount. Most importantly, they are getting it a great deal faster than we do." Unquote. And I continue with this very important quote of General Power. While we must advance painstakingly step by step, the Soviets use their uncanny technical intelligence to profit from our efforts, saving their own efforts to leapfrog over us to spectacular successes. What we try cautiously on a small scale, the Soviets often will do on a far bigger and more impressive scale." Unquote. Looking ahead, 20 years ago, General Power could clearly see that space warfare would revolutionize military strategy. Quoting from page 225 of his banned 1959 manuscript, the old military mandate, Take to the High Ground, is as pertinent in the dawning space age as it ever was to the rifle-bearing soldier. In wars of the past, High ground met elevations and hills measured in tens or hundreds of feet. Fighting downhill was always easier and more advantageous than fighting uphill. When the airplane became a tool of warfare, high ground met thousands or later tens of thousands of feet. Again, the greater height or altitude represented an important advantage in aerial combat. As the struggle for the strategic advantage of the high ground continues, altitude above sea level gradually becomes distance from the earth, and limitless space beckons as the ultimate battlefield." Unquote. Continuing on the same page, General Power penned the following prophetic words, There can be no doubt that the strategic use of space will revolutionize military doctrine again as much and perhaps even more than the airplane. Distance on the surface of the earth will lose what little military significance it has left, because the earth itself will become merely the focal point for the space theater of operations, and the continued compression of time for both action and reaction will in effect assume the role of a new dimension in military strategy." Unquote. Two pages later, he summed it all up in the phrase, quote, Whoever will control space will control the earth. Unquote. In these crystal clear words of 19 years ago, General Powell tried to let the American public in on the coming new era in military strategy based on space. He did not succeed because our secret rulers did not want you to understand. But today this new military dimension is a reality. Since the Battle of the Harvest Moon six months ago, it has become the exclusive domain of the Soviet Union, and they call it Cosmos Strategy. In his banned manuscript of 1959, and even in the revised version that was finally published six years later, General Power warned in clear terms about the strong prospects for surprise in our technological race with the Soviet Union. He pointed out that a long-range military planner of 1939 could not possibly have foreseen the jet bombers, supersonic fighters, hydrogen bombs, and intercontinental missiles of 1959. And because the pace of technological change is accelerating, he tried to warn that the very best projections possible in 1959 could likewise be rendered obsolete by unexpected, sudden new military developments. But General Power's warnings were silenced and ignored because they did not fit the two-pronged strategy of our secret rulers 
for world control that I mentioned earlier. As a result, America lost the most decisive battle of the 20th century, the Battle of the Harvest Moon, six months ago, and now the Cosmo strategy of the Soviet Union is like the nightmares of general power come true. One of the most startling weapons today in the Cosmo strategic arsenal of the Soviet Union is the Electrogravitic Floating Platform, or Cosmosphere as they call it. They are armed with charged particle beam weapons, and as I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 29 last December, they are responsible for the violent air quakes along the East Coast and elsewhere which the Federal Government is trying frantically to explain away. As early as 1962, over 15 years ago, some of America's top military officers could see the threat of floating platforms on the technical horizon and wanted to start working on a defense against them. General Thomas Power, then Commander of the Strategic Air Command, was one of these men. In the summer of 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis was in gestation, but General Power was already looking ahead to a possible Space Cuba of the future that would be even more serious. At a secret meeting at Maxwell Air Force Base, General Power described the floating platform concept that was already within reach of American technology, and he expressed frustration and worry over the refusal of the Kennedy Administration to begin developing any defense against a potential Soviet version of these platforms. Already the dismantling of America's military power under the guiding hand of then Defense Secretary Robert McNamara was underway. In 1964 General Power retired after heading the Strategic Air Command for seven years. In March 1965, thirteen years ago this month, the revised version of his book, Designed for Survival, was published at last, and on pages 243 and 244 you will find a warning by General Power that points specifically to the floating Soviet Cosmospheres that are now hovering over the United States and elsewhere worldwide. Beginning on page 243, General Power gives a warning of the urgent requirement of defense against a military threat from space. He says, quote, An aggressor would make the fullest use of the element of surprise. This would apply to the timing of the attack as well as to the employment of some radically new weapon or technique for which we are not prepared. It is quite possible that the Soviet surprise weapon would be an offensive space system, but beyond this assumption we can only speculate." Unquote. Further on page 244 he says, quote, For instance, it is conceivable that we may wake up one morning and find a number of Soviet satellites floating in stationary orbits over every part of the United States." Unquote. And a few words later he emphasizes, quote, We certainly must anticipate such a contingency, which is by no means far-fetched or far in the future and make sure that we have operational defensive systems or measures to cope with it." Unquote. There, my friends, you have it. Security restrictions prevented General Power from describing these hovering devices in detail in his published book, so he used a word for them that the public could most easily grasp, and that word is satellites. But as the former head of research and development for the United States Air Force, General Power knew very well that no true satellite can hover over any location in the United States. True satellites can hover only over locations on the Earth's equator. What General Power tried to warn us about thirteen years ago are electrogravitic floating platforms known today as Cosmospheres. General Power's warnings created a temporary sensation in 1965, but in the end they were ignored. One morning in December 1977, 
America did wake up with Soviet floating Cosmospheres overhead, and earthquakes began shaking houses and breaking windows in a mild illustration of what they can do. Today there are 70 Soviet Cosmospheres deployed worldwide, and we have no defense against them. Topic No. 2 Last month I gave a warning about the mushrooming activities of the Soviet KGB in Quebec Province, Canada. Soviet Bloc aircraft, including camouflaged Soviet troop transports, have been passing through the Mirabelle and Dorval airports in Montreal in large numbers. As of last month I was able to reveal the existence of at least 12 guerrilla camps in Quebec Province and over 3,000 KGB trained personnel in Canada. Today I can tell you more. The things I was able to tell you about last month are part of a much bigger picture involving France, the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union in a complex power play. But the bottom line is that the Kremlin is already making preparations for the invasion of the United States that is to follow the initial surprise nuclear attack. As always, the chess players in the Kremlin are planning their moves in sequence and far in advance. We are hearing a great deal today about the Separatist movement in Quebec Province, but in fact Quebec is being planned behind the scenes to be no more than a pilot project for all of Canada, which is intended ultimately to go the way of Quebec. In all this, the matter of language, French versus English, is only a superficial ploy or cover for the much more serious issues underneath. Years ago France saw the handwriting on the wall for Europe, given the domination of the NATO alliance by double-crossing rulers in the United States. So France pulled out of NATO to go her own way while quietly coming to terms with the Soviet Union in certain areas. Today there is a quid pro quo between France and the Soviet Union with respect to Canada. The Soviet Union is desirous of using Canada as a base for military operations against the United States and has induced France to provide entree to Canada through Quebec Province for this purpose. Even though Quebec is part of Canada and therefore nominally in the British fold, French influence there is very powerful. The inducements held out by the Soviet Union to persuade France to cooperate in this venture include both the carrot and the stick. The carrot is the prospect for France to expand her influence over all of Canada at the expense of her old rival, Great Britain. But the stick over France's head is the threat that if she doesn't play ball, the increasingly powerful French Communist Party will take over and end the existence of the French Government as we know it. And so far France is going along, and for that reason Moscow called off her dogs in the recent French election. That's why the French Communists behaved so strangely, wrecking the Socialist Communist Coalition and causing the Leftist Coalition to lose the election when they looked like sure winners to many. Within Canada itself all this is cemented by an element at the highest levels of the government. This element is working actively toward the goal of French-speaking Marxist République Populaire du Canada, People's Republic of Canada. This powerful faction in the Canadian government is not only cooperating with France in permitting Soviet entree through Quebec, but has also negotiated secret arrangements directly with the Soviet Union as long as two years ago. As a result, Soviet personnel infiltrated into Canada through Quebec Province are fanning out all across Canada. There remains another important segment of the Canadian Government who are not party to the Soviet-French intrigues now underway, who instead are pro-Canadian, pro-Britain, and generally pro-American. 
It is they who have been responsible for the efforts in Canada to stem the tide of Soviet activities there, ranging from nuclear sabotage operations into the United States last spring and summer to their recent sensational spy case. But this loyal segment is now losing influence relative to the faction who are party to the Soviet-French intrigues. This is due in large part to the self-destructive, weak behavior of the United States since the summer of 1976. Most of all, the total lack of effort by the United States to defend itself against mounting nuclear sabotage starting last spring has strengthened the hand of all those who say the United States is done for and deserves no further help. So now the Soviet Union is preparing already for the invasion of the United States. A joint operation by the KGB and the Soviet Army is now underway in Canada and in Mexico as well, although my reports there are more fragmentary so far. In the summer of 1976 the Soviet Union began planting underwater missiles in our own territorial waters in preparation for a nuclear surprise attack. The strategy was to strike from inside our defenses from short range that would afford us no warning time. Now the Soviet Army is embarking on a parallel strategy of preparation for attack when the moment comes. The Soviet Army is today the best equipped and best trained in the world, able to fight nuclear, conventional, or chemical warfare. Day in and day out we hear about the threat the Soviet Army backing up the other forces of the Warsaw Pact poses to Western Europe. But, my friends, the Soviet Army is not interested in Western Europe because Moscow has already become the de facto capital of Europe. NATO is in shreds, and Europeans have had enough of fighting wars generation after generation. Most of all, they see no hope in the direction of the United States. We have double-crossed, stranded, and sold out other allies too many times and the controlled Carter Administration is confirming that Europe too is expendable. Instead of Europe, the United States is the prime target now for the Soviet Army. While we have our military forces deployed at presumed front-line positions worldwide, the Soviet Army is now in the process of camping on our own doorstep in Canada and Mexico. Squads of Soviet troops are fanning out all over Canada to pre-assigned waiting stations, which are separated from one another in most cases by at least five miles. As of my latest report on March 27, two days ago, Soviet squads had begun re reaching waiting stations in every Canadian province except the Yukon. By the time you hear this report, Squads will be there too. The heaviest concentrations of these Soviet troop squads is in southern Canada, near the United States border, especially in Quebec, British Columbia, New Brunswick, and Alberta. Otherwise they are dispersing thinly throughout Canada. Right now the task of the Soviet troops is simply to reach their dispersed waiting stations, mostly in rugged or remote areas, establish themselves there in ways that do not attract attention, and just wait. They are to maintain themselves and wait however long is required, weeks, months, or longer, until they receive orders to start preparing for an offensive. Only then will the widely dispersed Soviet troops gather up their caches of arms, which include tactical neutron bombs, and start forming up into combat formations. Literally overnight 
the previously invisible Soviet Army in Canada and in Mexico will suddenly become visible as a massive fighting force that is ready to invade the United States. Just as the Soviet Navy has done with its underwater missiles, the Soviet Army is now in the process of positioning itself inside our main lines of defense. If all goes according to plan, and if this operation is allowed to proceed like the other Soviet activities against America, the 140,000 combat-ready American troops now secretly stationed near our border with Canada will be surprised and overwhelmed, and the battle for North America, like the Battle of the Harvest Moon six months ago, will go to the Soviet Union. Topic No. 3. I have pointed out in the recent past that nowadays wars are planned. They do not happen by accident. Those who are entrusted with our national security always include an inner circle who, doing the bidding of our secret rulers, know when war is coming because they themselves are helping to bring it about. But even as we are being set up for another round of needless suffering, waste, and carnage, we who are intended to be sacrificed are always kept in the dark about what is really going on, always in the name of national security. The instinct for cover-up by our secret rulers is always powerful, but nowadays it is even more rampant because they are now trying to hide terrible mistakes and failures on their own part. Nowhere is this more true than in the military environment now dominated by Soviet Cosmo strategy. Take Skylab, for example, which is fast becoming the Fort Knox scandal of space. Like the alleged tremendous United States gold hoard at Fort Knox, the 85-ton American space station known as Skylab no longer exists. As I reported last October in AUDIO LETTER No. 27, Skylab was blasted out of the sky on October 18, 1977 by a Soviet Cosmos Interceptor, that is, a killer satellite. The Cosmos Interceptor fired its charged particle beam weapon at Skylab, and Skylab erupted into an enormous fireball that was seen all the way from southwest Texas to points perhaps 800 miles away in Arkansas and Missouri. Nine days later the cover-up began. Suddenly NASA released a cover story to the effect that for some reason Skylab was sinking out of orbit years earlier than expected, and since that time the story has been revived periodically, each time with a little more pessimism about the chances of saving Skylab. Just as was done in the Fort Knox Gold Swindle, much ado is being made about something that does not exist, purely to fool the public. At Fort Knox in September 1974, a small single compartment of strangely reddish junk gold was shown to delegation of visitors, no gold experts among them, and the United States Treasury Department then proclaimed, See, it's all here. And today stories about Skylab are accompanied on television by file film and in print by photographs of Skylab to reinforce the assumption that Skylab is still up there. Now even the bogus gold audit, so-called, has its parallel in the Skylab cover-up. The Martin Marietta Company, which is controlled by our secret rulers, has been given a nine-month contract to spend $125,000 of American taxpayers' money to study the Skylab situation. Can you imagine? And what next? At Fort Knox the Treasury argued that it would be too costly to perform a gold inventory that would answer conclusively my charges about deficiencies in the gold supply. 
even though such an inventory had been carried out twenty years earlier without difficulty in only nine weeks. So don't be too surprised if one of these days NASA should announce, with deep regret of course, that budgetary factors will make it impossible to carry out a Skylab rescue mission. But more serious than the Skylab cover-up is the frantic cover-up efforts by the government of the Soviet Cosmospheres now floating over the United States and elsewhere worldwide. These are the very devices General Thomas Power was concerned about so long ago. They are armed with charged Particle Beam weapons which can do chores like destroying our ICBMs in their silos. They can also shoot military or other aircraft out of the sky, such as the Air India Boeing 747 that was blasted out of the sky early in January by a Cosmosphere near Bombay. But so far they have been used over the United States primarily in a weather modification role. For this purpose the Cosmospheres fire their Particle Beams in a defocused mode, causing the beam to be absorbed in the atmosphere instead of penetrating all the way to a target on the ground. In this way the Cosmospheres are able to alter drastically the electrical charges in the upper atmosphere which in turn strongly influence our weather. Many decades ago the electrical wizard Nikola Tesla predicted that weather control would someday be possible by altering these electrical charges. Now with the aid of their Particle Beam weapons the Soviet Union has proven him right thanks to the tremendous energy release achieved by Particle Beams. This energy is only a tiny fraction of the total energy contained in a large winter storm, for example, but it serves to trigger and guide these storms. As a byproduct of firing their Particle Beam weapons in this defocus mode for weather control, the Cosmospheres create tremendous air shocks or airquakes. These first began to be heard up and down the east coast of the United States on December 2, 1977, as Soviet Cosmosphere No. 1 in the list I revealed that month began firing. Cosmosphere No. 1 was floating at that time off the South Carolina coast. Thousands of people from South Carolina to Connecticut were frightened by the powerful rumbling blasts rolling in from the ocean, and windows and dishes were shattered in some areas. More recently, as I pointed out last month, these earthquakes have also been heard elsewhere than along the East Coast but no national publicity has been allowed to leak out about these other airquakes. Meanwhile, events in the Middle East are careening along ever faster toward war. The long-planned limited nuclear strike from the Sinai against Arab OPEC oil wells, which I first warned about in AUDIO LETTERS 5 and 6 in the fall of 1975, is fast approaching. The principal target in this strike is to be Saudi Arabia and for that reason the Rockefellers arranged to sell the oil fields back to Saudi Arabia, thereby saving their own money nearly two years ago. Saudi Arabia has never participated directly in any of the past Middle East conflicts, but now a relentless propaganda campaign is underway to paint Saudi Arabia as a major threat to Israel. United States Senators are beginning to spout the line that it is actually Saudi Arabia that is the source of support for Israel's bitter enemy, the Palestine Liberation Organization, the fighting arm of Al Fatah. Meanwhile, for more than a year Israeli fighter bombers have been secretly carrying out practice raids against the Saudi fighter base at Tabuk, deep inside the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia. As a result, Saudi Arabia is becoming increasingly eager to obtain American F-15 fighters, or if not F-15s, then Mirage F-1s from France to match the Israeli presence in the air. And in turn, a new Senate report has emerged which says that if we do sell F-15s to Saudi Arabia as part of the Carter Administration's so-called package deal, Israel may well feel so threatened as to mount a preemptive strike against Saudi Arabia. In all of this, 
both Israel and Saudi Arabia are being treated as expendable pawns by our own secret rulers. A cut-off of Middle East oil supplies, precipitating a national emergency, and dictatorial controls in the United States is still part of the objective, just as it was in the original plan two and a half years ago. But now, faced with the catastrophic shift in the military power balance toward the Soviet Union during the past six months, our rulers view the coming nuclear doom of OPEC as a scorched earth policy. That is, the oil riches of the Middle East are to be denied to the Soviets by capping off the oil wells with deadly radioactivity. After this is accomplished by an American strike from the Sinai disguised as an Israeli raid, Israel will be abandoned to fend for itself. But regardless of the wishful thinking of our secret rulers, these maneuverings and intrigues are not lost on the Kremlin. Three large Israeli Air Force bases have been built in the occupied Sinai with United States funds. One at Eytam e near El Arish on the Medi Mediterranean coast, one at Ophira o -F -I -R -A, near the southern tip of the Sinai, and one at Etzion, e Etzion, 15 miles southwest of the Israeli port of Elath on the Gulf of Aqaba. Et Zion alone cost over $4 billion and can handle the most advanced aircraft. Seemingly this would provide decisive control of the area, but floating over the Sinai now are five Soviet Cosmospheres, and there are ten more over and around Israel, one over northwest Saudi Arabia between the Et Zion Air Base in the Sinai and Tabuk the Saudi Arabian Air Force Base, four over western Jordan ranged along Israel's east border, one over southwestern Syria near the Sea of Galilee, one over a spot about 10 miles offshore near Etam Air Base, another about 10 miles offshore midway between Haifa and Tel Aviv, and two over Israel itself, one in the north and one in the south. They are all at an altitude of only 12 miles except the two over the Mediterranean Sea which are only 7 miles high. In addition, four undersea cobalt bombs for earthquake and tidal wave generation have been planted at distances from 40 to 60 miles offshore in an arc from southern Lebanon to north of the Sinai. They threaten Haifa, Tel Aviv, and the entire Israeli coast. It's clear that the Soviet Union has no intention of allowing any military action to take place in the Middle East that is not the Soviet advantage. For example, the Cosmospheres could stop any Israeli or American strike against Saudi Arabia in its tracks if desired, or if that strike will help in the Kremlin campaign to mobilize the Russian people for war, they might sit by, watch the nuclear strike take place and then destroy the planes on their way back to the Sinai. Anything can happen. Meanwhile the erratic behavior of the controlled Carter Administration and of Jimmy Carter himself is being turned to the advantage of the Kremlin. Less than two weeks ago on March 17, 1978, Jimmy Carter gave a major foreign policy speech at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It has been widely described as a tough talk, even though his threats had to do with little more than cutting back on economic and scientific cooperation with Russia. But the tone of the speech was perfect for internal Soviet propaganda purposes. Immediately the Carter speech was seized upon to fuel a fast-growing Kremlin campaign to convince the Russian people of an American threat so that they will support nuclear war when it comes. Then two days ago on March 27, 1978, the Kremlin unleashed a new ultimatum to the controlled Carter Administration to accept a SALT II Surrender Treaty. It was six months to the day after Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko had delivered the first 
sought to ultimatum on the basis of America's loss of the Battle of the Harvest Moon. This time the ultimatum was delivered in Pravda, the official organ of the Soviet Communist Party. The Pravda article urged the United States to make up its mind quickly on whether or not it wants a new agreement on strategic arms limitation. American rejection of the new agreement, according to the Pravda ultimatum, would, quote, torpedo international security, unquote. My friends, it's been said by some that Jimmy Carter is the last United States President with a chance to make decisions that will prevent the loss of American freedom, but that's not really true. Jimmy Carter is fast hammering nails in our coffin, but it was Gerald Ford who, as President, failed America at the most crucial point in our history. In AUDIO LETTER No. 17 in October 1976 I revealed in detail how President Ford knuckled under to squalid threats of a personal financial scandal and agreed to the treasonous Red Friday Agreement on October 1, 1976. In so doing, he undid the go-ahead he had given General George S. Brown, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to remove and continue removing the Soviet underwater missiles in our territorial waters. The Soviet rulers reached a profoundly important evaluation of the United States at that point. They had tried to surprise the United States in a double-cross and nuclear attack. They had been caught, tripped up by public exposure through my tapes limited though that exposure was, and yet they had ended up paying nothing for their failure. Instead, their former secret allies wanted to reinstate the former secret alliance as if nothing had happened, even to the extent of permitting underwater missiles to be planted along our shores thereafter without interference. And so the Soviet Union concluded that it might as well pull out all the stops in preparing to destroy America once and for all, because those who rule America behind the scenes had become so decadent and weak that they had lost touch with reality. The Anglo-Saxon West was ready to lie down and die. What a shame! What a tragedy! My friends, the actions of the controlled Carter Administration are leading us ever deeper into quicksand and by military power alone there is no hope that America can be saved, nor is there any hope that our present leaders, elected and otherwise, will snap out of a lifetime of deception, double-dealing, lies, and blackmail and truly act in the West's best interest. The only hope, my friends, is for the American people to turn back to our Lord Jesus Christ to throw out and punish those who are leading us to slaughter, and to pray that God in His mercy will turn away the plans of the Soviet Union to destroy us together with our evil rulers. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you.